You are now listening to the Highlight Reel Builder for Authors, the Going North Podcast. I'm your host, certified self-leadership trainer and author of the best-selling book, Stay the Course, Dom Brightman. And you're going to be getting some goodies today from the guest that's up next. And today on the High Live Real Builder for Authors, known as the Going North Podcast, I got to thank my good buddy all the way out in the land of Canada, for those who speak a box, but properly known as the wonderful country of Canada, for hooking me up with another wonderful, super special, awesome human from the Creative Edge Publicity Crew, baby. Because this guy right here, my goodness, folks, this guy right here, half Norwegian. My man is half Norwegian, folks, Canadian born, English raised and living on an island all the way out in Canada as well. Not only is he an actor, he's also an author and a rune reader. My goodness. And even better, he's even doing full time audiobook narration. So, my friends, if you're looking to get a good, sexy voice behind the voice of your book, you need to pull up a chair and find this man and check out his stuff in the show notes after listening to this wonderful episode. So let's give it up. For the one, the only, C.H. himself, not Chapter, but Chris Humphreys. How you doing today, sir? Uh, I'm doing so well, though I feel I should lower my voice about an octave to give you the real full sort of sexy growl, if people are going to be listening for that. (laughs) There you go. That's right. For the ladies, you're still on the market for the ladies, aren't you? Well, I, I, I think my, my lady might object to that slightly, but, uh, you know, for, for the sake of radio and journalism, let's just say I am. But, uh, but when, when my lovely cat hears this, be assured, darling, I'm not. Okay, beautiful. All right, so he's off the market, folks. We don't want his wife to kill him after this episode goes live. All right, we, <laughs> we need him alive. We need him alive. He's got more gifts to give to the world here. Yeah, there you are. Thank you. Yes, many books to write still, many, many performances to give. Oh, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Well, speaking of many performances, my goodness, I'm pretty sure I forgot a whole bunch of stuff with introductions since they're not allowed to be 55 minutes long. So mind filling in any cavities I missed about you? Well, uh, I suppose, uh, you know, you, you gave me all the titles. I've been an actor for, goodness, uh, 42 years now. Uh, I trained in England. Uh, I did a lot of theater there then sort of broke into television, went to Hollywood for a couple of years in the 80s. I don't know if some of your sort of older, long in the tooth listeners might have seen a, a biblical Roman epic called Anno Domini or AD in which I played a, it was a big mini series with big superstars of which I was not one, but I had one of the main roles and I played a Jewish zealot who became Rome's top gladiator. So I spent a lot of time in a loincloth and leather straps in... <laughs> in Tunisia, we filmed it in North Africa. And then I went to Hollywood for a couple of years. Um, I was born in Canada, but I left when I was two and actually grew up in Los Angeles till my, because my dad was also an actor and was trying his shot at Hollywood. So it kind of runs in the family. His father had also been out in Hollywood back in the thirties and the forties. So a um, bit of a family lineage going there. And then uh, back to England for a while. And then I came out to Canada in 91, stayed about five years, did a lot more theatre, went back to England for 10 years, and then moved out here fully in 2006, and then onto this beautiful island of Salt Spring in 2010. So it's slightly strange for me because I'm a Londoner, God help us, Governor, I'm a Londoner, born and bred I am. Well, not born, but bred at least. Um, <laughs> but now I live on an, on an island in British Columbia, which sometimes surprises me, but suits what I mainly do now, because I'm, though I'm still an actor, you know, I'm still doing an odd bit of theater and stuff. I'm mainly writing. And as you said in your intro, audio book narrating. So there's, um, you know, it's, it's, and particularly now, of course, your listeners will be more than aware of the situation the world is in right now. It's, it was a pretty good switch for me to be able to uh, start recording other people's books from uh, from what is effectively a duvet fort in uh, in my hut. <laughs> uh, that's what I'm talking about, indeed. And if I'm uh, not mistaken, with all of your wonderful Hollywood experience, like being a third generation family member who actually <laughs> had some Hollywood experience, whether it was 
extended time or not. I believe you also was a fight choreographer too with your time in theater. This is true. This is true. I did uh, quite a lot of that, um, mainly in Canada, actually, back in the day. There seemed, when I came to Canada in 91, there was, it wasn't nearly as organized as it was in England. So an interloper like me could step in and, uh, and do some choreography, which I, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll level with you, Dom. I became an actor so I could jump around with bladed weaponry. That was, that was <laughs> I, I wanted to be Zorro. I wanted to be D'Artagnan. I wanted, and you know, I ended up doing quite a lot of that. And so it was a fairly natural progression to choreograph fights as well. And in my novels, there's quite a lot of that sort of thing goes on as well, because I'm, I'm passionate about sword play and uh, my, my novels of, often, but not always reflect that. There's usually, there's often a bit of unsheathed blade in my books. Oh, yeah, that's right. All oh, the wonderful books. That's right. If I'm not mistaken, 11 of them out there, right? Well, actually, I think it's, uh, I, I think the, th I, there's actually double that amount out there. Um, the, 11, the 11 is the historical fiction side. Um, the, uh, the, then there's another nine, which are my fantasy side, which I think is probably what we're going to talk about a bit more today. I write fantasy as Chris Humphreys. I write historical fiction as C.C. Humphreys. And I'm also writing, I've also you know, uh, it gets up to, to 22 because I've written a couple of novels which haven't been published yet, one of which is a, a modern day thriller. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty varied. But yeah, in, in total, it's right now I'm, I'm, I'm working on my 23rd novel. So, which, which seems madness to me because I only started writing. <laughs> I only started writing novels 23 years ago. So that's really one a year, right? So it's uh, kind of crazy. Hey, well, that's freaking pretty good, man. You're past the ink drinking age of 21, man. Going for 23 novels, man. That's awesome. <laughs> that's, that's right. That's right. Though, of course, in England, you can drink when you're 16. Well, to, not technically, but you're people do. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's you know. But uh, uh, yeah, so uh, so that's that's the um, that's the um, the novel count, and I've also written four plays, which have been produced in various parts of the world as well. Which is, I start I started out as a writer, as a playwright, actually. So, um, so that was interesting too. My goodness, my goodness. So with all this love of writing, so where do you think it really came from? Was it just the reading of novels when you're a little boy or was it something else that just sparked the love of writing and pulling out? You probably pull out a quill, I imagine. I'm pretty sure you pulled uh, well, out a quill at least once. <laughs> yes, I've been known to wield a quill once in a while, but, but no, it's uh, the love of it. Yes, it, it, you know, I actually, Dom, I, I, don't, because of all the different ways I tell stories, I don't really define myself as one thing these days. I just call myself storyteller. You know, that's what I am. I'm a storyteller. And I was telling stories long before I knew you could even hope to earn a living from it. Of course, as a child, very, I was one of those kids who was always with the big imagination and, you know, let's play the, let's play the knights and uh, let's play uh, cowboys and, you know, all those. You know, I was the one organizing my, my friends wherever I lived initially in Los Angeles to, to play all these imaginative games. And, um, you know, we didn't have screens in my day, Dom. We didn't have, to <laughs> we were outside pretending that's what we did. Um, so the storytelling came from there. Then, yes, indeed, I did read a lot as a kid and, and again, gravitated very much towards uh, the adventure stories, the historical fiction stories, particularly loved all that stuff. And, um, and then uh, I wasn't going to be an actor at all, actually. My mother was dead set against it. She wasn't an actor and her father was and her husband was and her mother was. And so she didn't want her little son to be one. But uh, and I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I was about 17 and then I got cast in the lead in the school play. And of course, all that all those genes kicked in. And suddenly I thought, oh, hello, this is what I'm going to do. So went to drama school then and, and, and told other people's stories for quite a while which I mostly enjoyed. I mean, if you've seen some television, you'll know that there's some, some shows you just think, no, I hope that never sees the light of day. But, <laughs> but uh, most of it was great. And, um, but I always wanted to tell my own stories. And then, so, you know, I, I'd been writing bits and pieces for years, but lacked the confidence like most early writers do to take it any further. And then I wrote my first play uh, and um, in, in a competition and it won the competition. And I'd actually finished something and they paid me 500 bucks. So I thought, whoa, I'm a professional writer. 
And uh, then I wrote another play. And, um, but this idea for my first novel just had sat in my head for so long. And finally, after about six years of procrastination, which is another word for research, because I felt I needed to research everything before I started <laughs> writing, I then began writing what became my first novel, The French Executioner, about the man who killed Anne Boleyn of England, Henry VIII's wife. And, um, and, so, and, and because I'd been thinking about it for so long, it just kind of exploded out of me. And it was, um, well, it was perceived to be quite good. I got an agent on the back of it and she got me a two book deal and that was it. The first two book deal, I was uh, suddenly a professional novelist. And so that's what I've kept doing since then. That was just over 20 years ago. So yeah, love of, love of stories, love of telling them, love of acting them. And, you know, most people who read my books will probably be able to tell that I'm an actor. They're pretty dramatic and there's lots of good dialogue it comes from my playwright side, I suppose. And um, people always say to me, oh, I could see the film. And I go, well, I wish you would. <laughs> I could use that paycheck, I tell you. <laughs> oh, I hear you. I hear you indeed. And it sounds like you still have the same level of invigoration when you first started your journey, because it sounds like you're really enjoying yourself at this point in your career. Oh, yeah, I love, I mean, the, the, the publishing game has changed quite a lot. You know, for, for I, I was on the gravy train for a while in that they were paying me, you know, I, I'm not, I wasn't taking six figure advances home like some of the big boys or girls, but I was certainly uh, getting a living wage advance every year. You know, I could pay my debts, I could live for a year. It was all quite nice. But then that all changed. The publishing, we won't go into that all now, but the publishing industry changed quite a bit. So, um, so I needed to do different, different things to, to maximize the living, you know, go back to some acting, go back to, and just, you know, discover the audio narration stuff, which is, which is, you know, covers a lot of my skills, of course. But also I, I started um, what they call indie publishing, you know, so I'm, I'm now that, uh, that term, the hybrid author, in that I'm writing a high epic fantasy for one of the biggest houses, uh, one of the best known houses in the world, Gollants, which is a big fantasy house part of Hachette in the UK. So I'm writing uh, the Immortals Blood trilogy for them with uh, two books already out and, and one just going into edit. But then also I, I'd already written some fantasy for Knopf in New York, another great publisher. And, um, and then I, you know, they did okay when they came out, but then I got the rights back to uh, those books and decided to write a third, though, because there were two, The Hunt of the Unicorn, The Hunt of the Dragon, and then I wrote The Hunt of the Shapeshifters and recently brought them out myself uh, under the banner, the Tapestry Trilogy. So uh, there, that's a, um, uh, again, a fantasy uh, series um, with, a, with a young woman from Manhattan who is summoned by a unicorn through the amazing Tapestry Trilogies which are in the Cloisters Museum in New York, not too far from where you are, I suppose. And, um, uh, and uh, she's summoned into the land of the fabulous beasts where all our myths live. And this, uh, you know, this uh, Manhattan girl has to suddenly fight for her life against medieval tyrants and, and ravaging manticores and griffins and stuff and try to help this unicorn out as well. And that, I only thought that would ever be one book. And then I suddenly thought, yeah, but if I've done unicorns, I should really do dragons, shouldn't I? So, <laughs> so I wrote Hand of the Dragon, which, which turned out really well. And then um, finally I thought, well, I, you know, this, their story is not over yet. Uh, I want to get back to these characters. And so I came up with the idea when I, when I read that certain dragons, particularly in the Eastern dragons, had the ability to shape shift, i.e. they could take on other animals or even human guys for a little while. I thought, aha! shape-shifting killer serial killer dragons that sounds good so i wrote the hunt of the shapeshifters to conclude that trilogy so yeah so yeah yeah as you say still enthusiastic about stories i love them oh yeah that's what i'm talking about indeed that's what i'm talking about indeed so acting and creativity seems to run in the family genes baby and he's got all these wonderful talents so what's probably the biggest thing that's been helping you with the whole pivot that you had to make last year into the voiceover work, having to take your theater experience and put it toward the voiceover work? Um, well, I suppose it was overcoming my, my uh, technophobia, 
you know, there was, uh, I, I thought, well, you know, I'm, I was so used to being the, the gig actor, you know, just brought in to do the gig that I didn't worry about the tech so much. Uh, and, uh, but then, you know, I, I, I searched around and I stumbled across an amazing, having, you know, tried to play with all the normal recording things like uh, Pro Tools and stuff like that, which is, it's aimed at musicians, really. So I, uh, but then I found this amazing Danish uh, um, podcast originally, but then an audiobook narration system as well called uh, Hindenburg, of all things. And it was so straightforward to use. And, you know, then one or two other things I had to, I had to master there. But, and then I just, you know, I, I, you know, in the old old fashioned sense of the word, I hung up my shingle, my electronic shingle. I started saying, well, look, you know, I'm available. And then, and, you know, touch wood, I, I, I have as much work as I could possibly want. I have people coming to me quite often. And the only sad thing is I have to turn so many of them down because, uh, you know, I do, I, I have, I have work now for this year. If I want, I, I could do more, but then I wouldn't write. So I've got to balance, you know, the, the, uh, the writing of my books, which is my, my really primary love these days with the, you know, the, the earning my daily bread. So, um, so I, so, but it's, it's, it's great. They, they do sort of balance each other out. And I'm just having had a lot of stuff on with the launch of the Tapestry Trilogy and doing a lot of interviews and things like that. I'm just getting to a point in the schedule where now I, I wake up first thing in the morning, you know, big vat of coffee, dive in, write for two or three hours, then go to my hut and record for two or three hours. And that's sort of the day working itself out. Ah, uh, well, now I know how you're able to do all of that. The vat of coffee. All right. The two vats yeah. of coffee. <laughs> yeah. Lots of caffeine. Yeah. In fact, I'm starting to crave one around about now. So, uh. <laughs> yeah, I don't blame it because I did my first audiobook project at the end of last year. And I was like, oh, man, wow. Even with all even with all this public speaking experience, it's it's kind of a little arduous journey here as a novice. It's it's like a lot of energy is required. A lot of, oh, a lot of yeah. preparation. Oh. Well, good, good for you for getting into it. You've got a good voice, so I'm sure that's worked out well for you. It's, um, I, I, I'm lucky because I've always been a very good sight reader. So, you know, I, I, can, I can read the stuff. And, and, and the great thing is, of course, what I'm learning more and more, you make a mistake, you go back and correct it rather than worry about it, right? So. Oh, uh, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. So if I'm not mistaken, you have this new magical series, the Tapestry Series, man. My goodness, congratulations. Thank you so much. Yes, quite very exciting. I mean, I'm enjoying that getting out there. They're they're quite lovely stories. They're adventurous. They're funny. I mean, it's 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 great to uh, to deal with mythology. You know, like the mythology of the unicorn, and which is what really intrigued me to it to begin with. And and but then you know work it in kind of like a lot of the great stories I loved, like the stories from Narnia. You know, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. That idea of you know, uh, a present day uh, people from our world getting getting drawn into a into a magical world. Um, so that's uh, you know that that's uh, and and having to cope with with things that are beyond their ken, literally. You know, uh, so that that's exciting. And the other, yeah, and and but then the other series, the high epic fantasy, is completely made up. You know, that's the one that's uh, you know I've had to invent uh, a whole world or in this case actually four different worlds uh because they're all they all cohabit on the same planet but uh, but three of them don't know about any of the others and one knows about them all and is coming to take them so uh it's so uh, uh, that that's that's fun as well that's been uh, an interesting journey because th that that series is about immortality really and about how um it's a sort of has a resonance with our world because it's kind of about the one percent you know, in this case, the one percent are not super rich, though actually a lot of them are, because they are, but they are immortals, and they rule the world to suit themselves. And uh, but it's what happens when resentment builds up enough against that. You know, and so it's a, it's a, it's an interesting piece, and it's not, um, you know, it's. I mean, there are epic battles, and there's love, and there's, uh, you know, all, 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 you know, major ingredients that you might find in obviously things like Game of Thrones or stuff like that treachery and betrayal and heroism and cowardice and, and all those things but there aren't any um uh there's there's not sort of magic in the harry potter sense there's not witchcraft there's not conjuration there's ritual and uh 
and and uh, possession actually is a key thing where where um, some some of the immortals can possess other humans, li literally take over their body, while other immortals who are more sort of Viking-like, they can take over animals. So that's quite interesting as well to play with all that. Oh, yes, indeed. Definitely sounds interesting too, especially with the dragons and the unicorns. Any other mythical beasts you think you might tackle or that might be... <laughs> oh, no, there's, there's actually in Goloth, in the Tapestry Trilogy, there's all our myths are there. So there's a great sequence with the griffin, a couple in, in both book, in the first two books anyway, there's griffins uh, that uh, they're hunting the griffin to start with, and then the griffin attack. There's the manticores, which are really cool because they're like, they've got almost a human face, except they've got triple jaws and a tail with um, like a lion's tail, but with a ball of barbs on the end that they fire, poison barbs at people. They're quite cool. There's the cockatrice who of course can freeze you and kill you with a look almost. And, um, and there's this, the, the coolest character, well, one of the coolest characters for me is something called an Amphis Bina, which is a snake with two heads, but it hasn't got two heads on one end. It's got one head on each end. They kind of tug in other directions. And uh, this, so they, I, I call them Amphis and Bina. And there's a legend that they are obsessed by language so they are the language givers as well as the language takers, and they know every language, uh, every, every beast or, or man, and they're obsessed by words. And so they teach my heroine, Alice Elaine, basically, she, her superpower is how to speak every language. She can hear a little bit of it and suddenly knows it all. So, so that's quite cool. But one of them is quite... Um, one of them is quite sort of Shakespearean. Oh, forsooth, madam, and all that sort of stuff. The other <laughs> end, the other end, just uh, because they get stuck in the Bronx Zoo at one point, and because they're listening to, to because they come through to try to get her to go back in Hunt of the Dragon, and uh, and they're in the uh, they've been captured in the in the storm drains and brought to the Bronx Zoo to be examined, and they're in this um, sort of the infirmary because they got a bit hurt in the taking, and the one at one end who's Bina. Um, has been listening to the uh, the night um, watchman's. He he plays rap very loudly. So Bina is obsessed by rap. So I've actually I actually got the, the great fun of of researching, listening to a lot of rap, which I actually found I quite enjoyed, and then writing a rap because Bina tells her the story of what's going on back in Goloth to get her to go back. But I thought you know that could just be information. But why not make it a why not convey the information in an interesting way. So I wrote a rap, which was very cool. Made my made my 17 year old son just roll his eyes at me because you know, <laughs> as, as, as only a 17 year old son can do, you know, but uh, I said, hey, I've written a rap. And he goes, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Did you at least tease him a little bit further and put wear a hat sideways, a baseball cap sideways during yeah, a rap? Yeah, and I tried to do that gesture which you do with your hands, but I'm so bad at it. He just mocked me even more, so. <laughs> Uh, that's the that's the fun part about being a parent torturing the kids when they're teenagers like yeah, yeah absolutely absolutely <laughs> yeah oh man so since this is uh not your first rodeo and you're on this interview tour is there a question that you wish you'd be asked more often oh um well that's a that's a good question in itself um no you know i've i've been i've been covering most of the bases i suppose um you know uh the I, I dumb I can't I can't actually think of one offhand. It seems that it seems that much has been covered. One of the questions that 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 rarely gets asked is how your life that seems to be outside of writing is actually integral to writing. All that other stuff that you do to keep yourself sane, particularly in these times and afloat. Pe people don't say, you know, what are you doing when you're not actually sitting at your computer or you're not actually, um, you know, at your microphone? What what do you do to feed yourself? So I suppose that's a question you could ask me. Do you want to ask me that question or shall I just answer that question? Go on ahead and answer, my friend. I think uh, health, both physical and mental, is so important in anything we do. And I think particularly in, in the tough situation we find ourselves in in the world right now, you know, there's a lot of, I know there's a huge uptick in 
mental health problems and and all the ways the different ways people find to address those so you know i'm i'm so fortunate to live where i do and to to make a living doing what i do so i'm not in any way comparing myself to people who are in a much much worse position um but but keeping you know finding ways to stay sane finding ways to uh to connect with other people is obviously so important but also the solo stuff I do for myself. I'm a meditator. You know, I meditate twice a day. I uh, and I run, you know, two or three times a week. And I get to run in forests here, of course, which is gorgeous. And you know, I do. Uh, I, I eat well, and I, um, you know, I, I drink an occasional beer. But that's about the limit of my debauchery. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and and I uh, and I do some Tai Chi as well. So, you know, anything. I I I just believe that that. Everything I do, it's kind of, I suppose it's, it's, I hope this doesn't sound too pretentious, but it, it's a bit like being an athlete, I suppose, and you've got to keep training that you, you know, you train in order to be in, in uh, prime condition. So when you, when you sit down to, to write your book or you're an athlete and you, you, you know, stand at the, at the start line of a race, you, you've done everything you can to put yourself in the right state of mind to, to achieve your goal. So, so I think that sort of thing is important. And I, um, you know, I just hope, I hope a lot of people out there are finding the opportunity to, to do those things and be kind to themselves. And that's the other thing, you know, just say, this is, these are tough times and let's, let's really be kind to ourselves and give, give ourselves little treats that hopefully don't damage ourselves too much. Oh <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I can definitely see that again. And it's good that you do exercise to really keep yourself going because that's really how top performers stay on top of their game because it's really not pretentious at all to see yourself as an athlete because creativity, that's kind of basically a muscle and you're you're writing so many books and putting out so much content every year. It's like, oh, got to stay energized and got to do things that'll keep your mind expanded and ready for more information to take in and have the body ready to perform at that high level since voiceover acting, that involves your whole body. Well, it does really. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And um, yeah. So, so yeah, no, it's, it's, I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a, a, a looking after yourself uh, in order to do what you really love to do. That's, that's the thing, you know, it's not, it's not for no purpose. You're looking after yourself in order to, well, in my case, be creative. That's right. Creative Chris, baby. That's right. The <laughs> triple C himself, baby. That's me. That's me. <laughs> Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Well, we're coming down to the magical question that every guest gets to receive. And that is if you're to wake up tomorrow and you're 25 again, but this time in 2021, with all of your knowledge and experience, what advice would you give to yourself? Wow. That is a good question. Does it have to be 2021? Because we're still, you know, it, the, our options are so limited at the moment in terms of, you know, I, I, um, I think I'd have, you know, if, 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 if I was 25 again, whenever, you know, that was, that's in prehistory, of course, now for me, but, uh, but if, but if I was 25 again, I suppose I might say to myself, be a little less focused on your career. And I know that's, that sounds odd coming from, because I was such an ambitious young actor, you know, and I, I did really well in my twenties, you know, as I told you before, went to Hollywood, all that stuff, played some amazing roles, uh, earned quite a lot of money. And, you know, and, but, but importantly, did, did all this great act, you know, what I'm, well, I mean, for, it, it was, for me, it was great acting. I'm not sure other people thought it was great acting, but I certainly thought it was. Um, but I think I, it was only when I was sort of in my thirties that I really looked around the world and said, you know what, I need to see more of this. You know, uh, because when you go and work somewhere, you see something, of course, like I spent 10 months in Tunisia and saw quite a lot of the country because I worked in it. But but, you know, I, I then started traveling and I think I'd have probably said, you know, get a little more traveling under your belt. Make sure you get out in the world and see things and meet people. And because that would then have fed into something I didn't um, uh, I, I didn't know I'd be doing. I dreamed I'd be doing but that would then really feed into the writing. And I then did that, of course, but it was a bit later on. I did a lot of traveling, Southeast Asia, South America, um, you know, did a lot of, uh, all, uh, a lot around Europe, of course, and, and a lot in North America. So uh, that's what I might say to myself, just chill out a little on the, uh, on the professional life and just focus on life itself. Uh, 
definitely love it definitely love it heck seems to be quite a theme with quite a few of the guests every so every now and then where it's like oh this one's like oh, i gotta be so serious gotta do all this stuff before i turn 30 it's like oh i gotta get all this done i gotta keep at the top of my game all the time i gotta be ultra serious and it's like oh you know maybe i should just chill out just a wee bit and yeah. enjoy life absolutely yes that's right indeed so that's right so be creative and chill yeah yeah oh yeah that's right like an ice cube and a lamp just be chill <laughs> <laughs> absolutely <laughs> uh, so for those who want to chill out and read all 20 well i'm going to say 23 since 23 will be out probably by the end of this year of your books and all the wonderful stuff that you'll be doing in the future what's the best way for folks to keep up with you well it's probably just check in on my website which is authorchrishumphreys.com it's a fairly new website and so you know all the books are listed there and there are links if you want to have a look at them uh tapestry trilogy is only i mean again the links are on the web page but it's only available at the moment through amazon but you can get it as a as a printed book or a or a um uh, obviously an ebook, or I've also done the, uh, cause I've done a number of my own books. I've also done the audio book of that and that you can pick up through all your usual retailers or even go direct to find away voices. Again, the link is on my website, but I have an, I have almost have a shop front there where you could buy Hunt of the Unicorn. If you wanted to hear my, if you were not fed up of my dulcet tones by now, then if you wanted to hear me whispering a story to you, there's a few of mine on there. So uh, but yeah, yeah, that's the best way. And you can follow me at Humphrey CC on Twitter, uh, CC Humphreys on Instagram. I have a Facebook, uh, Chris C. Humphreys professional page. You know, all the, all them usual things, Dom. Woohoo! The good kind of usual, baby. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. So there you have it, folks. Head over to his wonderful website, baby. Check it out. Like 500 library books. Buy three copies each of all of his books. Tell your friends about it. Heck, even buy all of his audio books, too, since he's reading it. And he's a the theater actor. So my man's got the background to make it pop and come to life. So you won't fall asleep. And if you do, you'll be dreaming that you'll inside of his world and you won't be able to wake up until the book is over. So definitely check it out, folks. Check it out indeed. So any parting words before we close up shop, Chris? No, Dom, thank you so much for this opportunity. I've thoroughly enjoyed talking to you. Uh, now the sun is blazing down on my deck. I might just go and sit and look at the water for a bit get some get some charging in before my next bit of uh, burst of writing or recording this is your host don Brightman. hope you enjoyed what you just heard and if you really did do me a solid and leave a review if you're listening on apple Podcasts, on youtube wherever you're listening to and subscribe to hear more because more is coming your way to advance you further than before <laughs>